coming out to original navigations, the reading of Portuguese and American and Brazilian American writers. Um, our thanks again to the Village Market for having us here and for everyone for every one of you who came out tonight to hear us. Um, our next reader is Tony John Roma, who received a Bazzanella Literary Award for Short Fiction and a partial scholarship for the Disquiet International Literary Program in Lisbon, Portugal in 2011. He has had work published in the Portuguese American Journal. He was conceived in the islands and emigrated in utero here to the United States. <laughs> Please give up for Tony. Thank you, everyone. And again, thank you for coming. It's good to see such a wonderful crowd. I'm going to do a little balancing act, too, here. So, um, so I'm going to read uh, two scenes from two different stories, but they're, they involve the same character. Um, the first story, uh, when he's a child, and then the second, the second scene, when he's an adult. Um, the first story is called Cousin Primo. In this country, the streets were lit at night by huge electric lights, lots of them, and the moon seemed dimmer and farther away than it had been in the islands. The streets themselves were like long slabs of stone, more solid than the crumbled rock that covered the roads back home, and smoother than the cobblestone streets the boy had seen in the villa. Even here in the hills, where he walked with his mother to her housekeeping job, Mang, José said, squinting up at the street lights, dim and dull during the day, their long necks craning over parked cars. Why is Frank my primo? It was one of the questions the boy asked often, like, why can't we have coffee like we had in the islands? As if repeating the question would replace the bitter drink diluted with milk and sugar with the chicory brew he had been brought up with. Because Francisco is your cousin, his mother said, then recited the litany of begats that described their recent genealogy. Family histories from the old country go something like this. Manuel Tavaj of Umanuel was the son of Raimundo de Betancourt Tavaj, whom they called the Americano because he spent 15 years working at the Point Reyes dairies before returning the Azores to marry, buy property, and start a family. Raimundo's mother was Dona Manuela Betancourt, sister to Maria Marina Betancourt, who was the mother of Maria de Deus, Maria de Jesus, Maria do Espírito Santo, and Maria de Conceição. <laughs> Mary's all of God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Conception, covering all the sacred bases, a holy home run of sorts. Maria de Conceição, who was just called Conceição, and then Connie when her family moved to California and enrolled her in elementary school, married Fernando Betancourt, who, despite the common last name, was not a previous relation. He is from the Alan Graciosa, Connie from San Jorge. Connie and Fernando have three children, Elizabeth, Tony, and Michael. Michael is the one with the drywall business in Hayward, father to Francisco Betancourt. His name is Frank, not Francisco, José said. He doesn't like being called Francisco because he's American, and I don't want to be his cousin. <laughs> what has he done to you, Fido? His family helped us. He helps you in school. You should have respect, his mother said. Sim, senhora, José pouted. Frank was a stocky kid whose face had edges like a wheel of cheese, and eyes that seemed to look down on everyone even though he was the shortest boy in class. José didn't tell his mother that Frank knocked his books and papers off his desk every day. He didn't tell her that Frank taught him to raise his hand when he needed to go to the bathroom and say when the teacher called on him, up yours, Mrs. Vargas. <laughs> He didn't tell her he sat back, he sat behind him just to kick the bottom of his chair when he was trying very hard to learn this new and complicated language. He didn't say anything because he knew Frank's father had helped his dad get work at the factory. Even when the Betancourt sat behind them in church, Frank would kick the pew or pull on the tail of hair that José had started to grow to be like the rest of the boys. When José would turn to glare at him, both father and son stood there grinning. Jose's parents said nothing, and sometimes his father would grip his arm, keeping him face toward the altar. Jose was tired of that smirk on Frank's already puckered face. Frank's grandmother, Connie, was always urging Frank to play with his cousin, to help him. 
Perhaps the woman did feel some empathy with Jose's situation. As she liked to tell him, she too had been brought to this country as a child and understood the difficulties of the change. We should call you Joey, she once said, softening the J and opening the O as the English name passed through her still Portuguese voice. It sounds more American. Not the way you say it, of all, Frank snickered. Be nice, Frank, she said. You don't know what it's like. Poor creature. It was a common term, but in America it had taken a different meaning for Josette. Connie said it too often, and in a way that made him feel that his family faced a long struggle to become American. Until they had a home, a car, a wider variety of clothes, they still were not American. Until they had a piece of the bounty that surrounded them, they were strangers among the rest, even when many of the poor people in San Leandro spoke Portuguese and kept old traditions. But José had never felt poor until coming to this country. These other Portuguese, these luso americanos talked about how rough life was in the islands, how he would be better off here and have so many nice things. But José had never felt that life in the Azores had been anything less than delightful until he was told it hadn't been. Now, that story goes on. José uh, deals with his cousin, uh, <laughs> manages to get through school, go to college, and get a good job like a good Portuguese son does. And uh, he's taken out of state for that job for about 14 years and uh, returns to this community of San Leandro to find it has changed quite a bit. Let's see. The second story is called The Men. This is a scene from them. With each trip through the neighborhood, Joe's memory was chipped away by the reality of the present. At one time, they could move down Davis Street, from east to west, from the church to Highway 17, crossing intersections that were not defined by the signs that were displayed on their corners, but by the people who lived on each street. Orchard Avenue, they called Huleca because at least 15 Portuguese Hawaiian families had lived there. The Perrys, the Madeiras, the Pimentels, none of them remained. The Azorians had been everywhere else. There were a few families from the island of Pico on Pacific Avenue. The neighborhood to the north, behind Davner and Prada Streets, was largely populated by the people from Fayal. Further west, between the freeway and Bitta Ireland Bakery, which was recently purchased by an Asian family, were the Georgetsch, immigrants like Joe from the most central of the central islands, now at the edge of this archipelago community. They had left the ragged boundaries of the islands for the rectangular cement grids that now define their place. But so many of them were gone now, gone with the closings of the pencil factory, of Meyer's drum company, of the caterpillar plant. What about Senora Leotina? Joe asked his uncle. She moved to Newark with her son, Tio Almeida said. She was sick, could not live on her own. Almost everyone is gone, Joe said. Oh, Fiju, you went, Tio Almeida said Tio Almeida. Everyone go to where you make a living. Joe thought about the 20 people who had attended the Portuguese Mass on Saturday. He was not a practicing Catholic any longer and only went to accompany his mother. We used to fill that church on Sundays, he said. His uncle chuckled. He had a growl of a laugh that sounded like something was loose in his chest. There was no one else of Joe's age at the Mass, no one younger than his mother. As he looked around the church, the congregants smiled and nodded at him in recognition, and afterward they each came over to say how good it was to see him. José, they said, or Joey, or Zezinho. He tried to remember them as they had been when he was a child, but their younger faces would not come to mind. Their wrinkles and white hair had been superimposed on the memory of 20 and 30 years past. Yet after seeing the Crea sisters at the Luzo Mercado, he could clearly remember them as children, dancing with him in the folkloric group, marching in the Holy Ghost parades. They existed in his mind now as adults, then as children, but the older people were just now. Are there more people in the neighborhood? 
Maybe we don't go to church anymore, Joe asked. His uncle puffed his lips as he turned the steering wheel hand over hand to make a right turn. Sure, some. There could be more we don't know about, Joe said. Tio Almeida's chest rumbled again. I think your mother know about everyone. Joe said, I want to know where everyone went. This was also Portuguese. We were everywhere. As he spoke those words, he realized that the only time the Americans knew they existed was when they blocked traffic for a procession of Our Lady of Fatima or the Holy Ghost. After the festival, the Portuguese would fade back into their homes, their Sunday masses, their prayer meetings, soccer clubs and philharmonics, where no one but the other Portuguese recognized them. He wondered if he had become more American than Portuguese, if he could no longer see who was around him. In the passenger seat of his uncle's pickup truck, Joe dreamed of getting a truck like the Portuguese man who used to sell potatoes on Huacaneca every Sunday. But he would fill the truck bed with Portuguese flags. He would park it in front of the Silva Bakery or the Luzo Mercado, where the Portuguese would come to investigate. Bandeiras Portuguesas, he would shout. Take a flag, take a flag. Using only the only date he knew from his people's history, he would tell them, take a flag and hang it up on April 25th. All of us, no 25 de abril, outside our doors, in our windows. And the Portuguese would spread the word. More of them would come with their new old faces and their new young children. Men with short garden hose over their shoulders, women in house dresses, their hands still damp with dishwater or warm from kneading the soft yellow dough of sweet bread. Boys wearing red sashes, girls wearing the cape of Saint Isabel, <coughs> gathering folded flags in their skirts to carry to the masses, armies of musicians in their band uniforms. Take them for your Portuguese neighbors, as Zingy would shout, or anyone who is too ill to come. Why are you taking two, an old man would ask another. For my brother, he would reply. Your brother's dead for his grave. For their graves, for their graves, the people would murmur, now taking three or four of them for the Portuguese who could never return to the earth from where they came. The flags would make their way across the city, the state, the country. And on April 25th, they would unfurl all at once. People who didn't know the Portuguese existed would ask about the red and green visible in every direction. They would learn the Portuguese were there and had been there a very long time. More importantly, the Portuguese would know. They would remember. They would be reminded of their origins, of their heritage, and of their too quiet presence.